Hello, PodBee students. Here we are again. We are talking about market structures. We're studying chapter seven, which is discussing market structures and market failures. The last time we were together, the last screencast was talking about perfect competition. Perfect competition is the most competitive market structure. There's lots of producers creating identical products. It's easy to get into the market, but they have no control over prices. Today, we are going to be studying monopolies. Um, you might be familiar with the term monopoly, like the board game, but the idea of a monopoly um, is really the opposite of perfect competitions. Um, and to be honest, most markets are not perfectly competitive. Um, anything that would be defined as imperfect competition is a market structure in which producers have some control over the price of their products. So in other words, the pro uh, producers have market power. The most extreme version of imperfect competition and the opposite of perfect competition is a monopoly. So if you look at the spectrum, that's on the screen. You've got perfect competition, which we've already discussed. It's way over on this far end, the most competitive. Today, we're talking about monopolies. They are on that complete opposite end of the spectrum. Um, They're going to have less competitors. Um, a true pure monopoly is one producer with a highly unique or specific product, uh, lots of barriers to entry, and substantial control over prices. So we're going to talk about that a little bit more here today. So like I was explaining on the last slide, when we're looking at a monopoly, we're looking at one producer with a unique product. So a monopoly is a market or an industry that's really consisting of a single producer of a product that has no close substitutes. Um, so we've got that one producer. There's no competition. This is the one person that creates a producer that creates this product. Uh, they are controlling the industry or the market when it comes to that good or service. Um, there is also, again, like we were saying, a unique product with no good substitute. Nobody else provides similar goods or service. Um, it's that producer alone. Because of this factor, there are high barriers to entry. Monopolies can exist because it's really difficult. We talked about barriers to entry that last time, high startup costs, um, control of resources, technology. Those factors would apply here with a monopoly. It's really hard um, to become a producer in that market because somebody's been doing it and doing it well for such a long time that it's hard to get in. Um, there's a high startup cost because of the uniqueness of that that product. Um, there, it, maybe it's a natural resource. We'll talk about that more later. There's other factors that are making it really difficult for uh, an entrepreneur to get into that industry. Um, so because of the uniqueness of the product and because they are the sole producer, this gives them substantial control over prices. Monopolistic firms have great market power because they have complete control over the supply of that good or service, which means they're setting prices without any fear of being undercut by a competitor. They are price setters rather than price takers, which gives them a, a substantial amount of control. So um, monopolies uh, really kind of came to, to their height during the late 1800s. Um, there were quite a few monopolies that started to arise in the United States. Um, some of them took the form of, you know, one firm or group, or excuse me, just one firm or company that controlled the market for this unique product. Others um, formed what was called or referred to as a trust, which would be a combination of firms. So a bunch of firms working together to get rid of the competition and to set prices. One of the most famous that your book talks about, and if you remember from U.S. history, you're probably familiar um, with J.D. Rockefeller and the Standard Oil Company. Rockefeller built his monopoly by buying out his competitors. He would buy them out or bankrupt them until he controlled about 90% of U.S. oil sales and had that Standard Oil Company. Um, as Congress started to look at the power that was being given to these uh, these trusts or firms 
monopolies, um, they decided that they would enact antitrust laws to limit their formation. In 1911, the federal government took Standard Oil to court for antitrust violations and broke it up um, into several uh, smaller companies, if you will. There's a great diagram in your book on page 118 um, that refers to um, the the smaller competing companies as baby standards. So when Standard Oil was broken up in 1911, they broke it down and divided it up into smaller um, companies that were essentially competing against each other, but still the starting from that original Standard Oil company, and they nicknamed them baby standards. And then each new company took over Standard Oil operations in a specific region of the U.S. But when you hear the term uh, trust or antitrust laws, and just a hint, this will be coming up on the summative assessment for this unit, um, antitrust laws are trying to stop those monopolies. Their sole purpose is to investigate companies to make sure that they're not violating um, those practices and that they're not in um they're not at risk to becoming a monopoly. So when you start hearing about companies now that are going after and consuming other companies in their industry, um, like Disney going in and buying up other production companies, um, a lot of times, or banks also have, have this issue. It happens a lot in the entertainment industry. Um, so a lot of times they have to go under um, kind of investigation, if you will, by the U.S. government to ensure that they're not becoming a monopoly. They want, the government wants to ensure that they are still um, competitive and offer competitive prices to consumers. So the government seeks to prevent the formation of the monopolies, like I was just kind of explaining. However, it allows certain kinds of monopolies to exist because of very particular circumstances. So there's actually three broad categories of legal monopolies, and those are all here on this slide for you. So the idea of a legal monopoly, um, they are resource monopolies, they are government-created monopolies, or a natural monopoly. So I'm going to talk about each one and give you an example because this could come up on some assessments going forward as well. So resource monopolies exist when there is a single producer who controls a key natural resource. Okay, so other firms can't enter the market because they don't have access to that particular resource. So for example, maybe there's a company that has the only stone quarry in town, they're able to monopolize the local market for building stone. Um, resource monopolies are pretty rare because the economy is large and the supply of resources are not usually controlled by one person, but that would be an example of a monopoly that would be legal or allowed. Um, the second category is government-created monopolies. So these are formed when the government grants a single firm or an individual the exclusive right to provide a good or service. Oftentimes they do this when they feel that it's in the best interest of the public. So there's a couple different ways that these could be formed. The one that you're probably most familiar with are patents and copyrights. So if you think about it, a patent or a copyright is essentially a legal monopoly. It's saying, hey, you're an inventor or you're a creator, we're going to give you the right to control the production, sale, and distribution of this product for a set period of time. All right, sorry, patents and copyrights. I had to take a break there. I had a kid come running in the room. All right, so we were talking about patents and copyrights and how those are legal monopolies. Again, the idea is that it's giving exclusive rights, so whether it's music or art or an inventor, it's giving you just a set period of time that you can have control over that particular um, product, good, service. Uh, public franchises are another example of a, a government created monopoly. So this would be a contract that the government issues to a particular firm that gives them the sole right to provide a good or service in a certain area. The best example is the National Park Service. They give public franchises to companies to give, uh, provide food or lodging or other services within that national park. School districts do the same thing when they might issue a public franchise to a snack food company to solely um, be the one to have the vending machine in that public school. So whether that's something like Coca-Cola or Pepsi or Frito-Lay, that would be giving that company or firm uh, a monopoly 
in that certain circumstance or, or situation. And then the last government created monopoly is licenses. So a license would be a legal permit to operate a business or enter a market. Um, and in some cases, licenses can create a monopoly. So if a state grants a license to one company to conduct all vehicle admission tests in a particular city or town, or um, they might license a parking lot company to provide all the public parking for that city, that is going to, again, be in the best public interest. It's going to ensure that certain goods and services are provided efficiently and in a regulated way. And then the last type of legal monopoly is a natural monopoly. These are utilities. Think of natural monopolies as like your utility industries, gas, water, electric, cable TV. Um, this is um, arising when there's a single firm that can provide that good or service more efficiently and at a lower cost than two competing firms will, would. So it's the idea of um, how the barriers of entry would be so high uh, in order for another competitor to come in to, you know, control that gas line to offer a you know, a competition for that or to um, provide the cable or Wi-Fi services. That's why you really only see Comcast or Xfinity as the cable provider. Um, the infrastructure of that is so complicated and so difficult that it would makes it almost impossible for there to be a competitor until we had came up with online streaming services. Those are the most natural competitor now to something like a cable services or a Comcast. So natural monopolies, think of them as utilities. It's going to be more efficient and in the best public interest to have that one company provide that service because the barriers of entry are so high. So a really quick case study on a monopoly. So a monopoly case study, if you will. They talk about it in greater detail in your book if you want to take a look. But Microsoft Corporation is a, a recent example of a company that was accused of becoming a monopoly. So in the 1980s, Microsoft received copyright for their Windows program, which is a computer operating system most of you are probably familiar with. And they basically made deals with computer makers to sell their computers with Windows already installed, which allowed them to gain control of 90% of the market for operating systems and pretty much drove all of their competitors from the market. Long story short, the government accused them of antitrust violations, took them to court, um, and found them guilty of antitrust violations in 1999. The outcomes of those, um, you know, originally they were told to break up their company into separate businesses. Eventually they appealed the decision to a higher court, which overturned that breakup order, but still upheld the antitrust verdict. So in 2002, Microsoft actually settled their case with the government by agreeing to change the way that they dealt with other software firms. Um, but this would be a modern example of a monopoly that you might be familiar with or have heard of. So. What's the consequence of a monopoly for consumers? Uh, it sounds really great for the producer, right? High prices, control of the market, creating this unique product, which a lot of us want. The biggest consequence really impacts the consumer. So because a monopolistic firm has that considerable market power, they can set prices without the fear of any type of lower price competition from other firms. And as a result of that, the consumers might have to be forced to pay more for something than they would if there were competitors in that that market. And because the firms face little or no competition, the other pieces, they typically have very little incentive to become innovative or to work hard to satisfy consumers. So really the, the, the group that loses the most when it comes to a monopolistic market structure are the consumers. They have to pay higher prices for those goods and services. Um, they don't have the option to go anywhere else if it's something that they have to have, like utilities. Um, even legal monopolies have these consequences. Typically, consumers are going to have to pay more for that good or service, and they, those companies don't always have to improve or do things that benefit the consumer because they know that the consumers are really uh, tied to needing that particular industry and that they really can't go elsewhere. So that is our second market structure looking at monopolies. Uh, we will move on and talk about monopolistic competition and oligopolies next. Thanks for listening.